Hallelujah. How's everyone doing this morning? Come on, stand on your feet. Glory to God. It's going to be a great day in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Say this with me this morning. Say, the presence of God is going to touch me today. Hallelujah. Lift your hands to heaven. Just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Maranda de Tistase, and Abra that a Kelerethe, Igara that a scoso bro, the Talenestia chose so sobra all the Latatene, Merethia dambo, sombo, cobra, danda resta, so chiara that the eta si, Baron coco, le meredicie, Babro vavo, tarotosto, sabara caleditia giskie, En aranda da nasio, sabara danie, Hallelujah, Moraka zam para the de fishe sebe conono. Abro cole pradati and astrosopa. Merethi di liste se chanda de tia de sequida de de. Gorondo lo totoro bastasa. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. O no curada sa, baja brade de egesi. Igine antas jo sombro da tali. Borongo sco sombra de telenestia cheje. Anjara dan de nesia jo babara dan de e. We worship you, Lord. Caracanazo zoncona. Arande dini shi se se we honor you lord i babro ola toro kosko sombra da tenestia chagi moro no no total e brother kenenestia ke ono za sombra da tenestia se fia ko mambro golam brother telefevia de tenestia chari ya da tata baro le fede de ti edese eresta kara dando koskia barra da de amana mere de kira be che bro da coloroto orosa fora dandi e che Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you honor and glory this morning. We thank you for the wonderful privilege of entering into your house, of entering into your gates, of entering into your courts. We thank you, Father, for your mighty presence that is here in our midst this morning to touch and change us, to transform us by your mighty power. We give you praise today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Father, do a mighty work in this place. Touch every life. Touch every heart, Father. Let not a single person who walked through those double doors into this sanctuary leave the same way they came. Let a tangible touch of your anointing come over them today and transform them, Lord, from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Let them be changed today in Jesus' name. Let any sickness or disease represented in this place be undone by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Let any despair or discouragement represented in this place be undone by your anointing in Jesus' name. And Father, we come expectantly to you with our hands lifted high, with our hearts open. We come expectantly to you today to receive from you what only you can do. And we give you praise today in Jesus' mighty name. And if you're with me this morning, say, Amen.
we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stone.
Hallelujah. 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 Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or stretched out the heaven with a span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure or weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or being his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel? And who instructed him or taught him in the paths of judgment? Or taught him knowledge? Or showed to him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance before him. Behold, he takes up the islands as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering, for he is worthy of more than that. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to less than nothing and vanity. <laughs> to whom then shall we liken our God? And what likeness shall we compare unto him? The workmen can melt together a graven image, and the goldsmith spread it over with gold and cast silver chains. And he that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation chooses a tree that will not rot and seeks unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image, but it does not move. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told from, to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth that it is He, the Lord, that sits upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are like grasshoppers? He stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. He brings princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth as vanity. <laughs> Yea, they shall not be planted, neither shall they be sown, neither shall their stock take root in the earth. He shall blow upon them and they shall wither. The whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then, saith the Lord, shall you liken me? And to whom shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who has created all these things, that brings out their host by number. Hallelujah. Who calls all the stars by name, from the greatest to the smallest. For it is He, the Lord, that is strong in power and cannot fail. So why do you say, my way is hidden from the Lord and my judgment is not seen by God? Have you not known, have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth does not faint neither grows weary. There is no way to come to the end of his understanding, but he gives power to the weak and to them that have no might, he increases strength. The young may, sh may faint and grow weary. The young man may utterly fall, but those that press in and hold on to the Lord shall renew their strength. Those that press in and hold on to the Lord shall renew their strength. Those that press in and hold on to the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. 
they shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't serve a graven image melded together by a coppersmith or a goldsmith. We serve the living God who measured out the oceans in the span of his hand, who numbers and names the stars. To him shall all the nations be likened to grasshoppers and dust. They shall wither and shall be no more. But those who press in and hold on to the Lord their God. To him shall he increase strength. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. How many know you serve the living God in this place this morning? And there's nothing that's too hard for him. Hallelujah. No pain he can't reverse. No damage he can't undo. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. 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 Since I've started teaching eschatology, the study of the end times, one of, one of the number one questions I get asked is, what if I didn't bury my loved one? What if I, what if I cremated them? How is the Lord going to raise them up in the rapture? And I remember the first time I got asked that question, it stumped me. So I went home and I meditated on it. And the Lord ministered to my spirit. Even if your loved one was buried in a suit with a Bible, as they used to bury people. If enough time has passed, their body has completely decomposed anyway. They're dust. From the dust we are, and to the dust we shall return. But on the day of the rapture, the Lord will cause those molecules, whether they be ashes from cremation or a decomposed, He will cause every molecule to be reformed and joined to Him in the heavens, and they shall receive a glorious body. Now, I, I, <laughs> now I say that to you this morning because if the Lord can do that to a cremated body that's nothing more than ashes now, or a decomposed body that's nothing more than dust now. Why don't you think he can do that for that dream that you've let decompose? Or that thing that's fallen apart, that you felt is hopeless, that you felt there's no way it can be repaired. I'm here to tell you this morning, the Lord can bring it back to life. The Bible says even the dead are alive to him, hallelujah, all live to him. And so there is nothing that is too dead for his resurrection power. Can you say amen? So I'm here to tell you this morning, it doesn't matter how long your children have been. Why do you think he needs 10 years for your situation? He doesn't need five minutes. He just needs a moment of your faith connecting with his power and everything changes. Come on, can you see that in your spirit this morning? Hallelujah. 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 And I see the Holy Ghost touching people in this place this morning. Hallelujah. You're leaving this place built up by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll tell you this this morning. If you're still drawing breath, God has a plan for you. Hallelujah. Now, don't stop drawing breath in this service. God's done with you. Wait till one. Amen. But I don't believe God's done with anybody in this room. I believe your best days are ahead of you. 
Oh, but pastor, I'm getting older. Don't argue with me. Your best days, your best days are ahead of you. Hallelujah. I feel y'all hooked up this morning. Amen. Somebody's believing God for a miracle in here today. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I just heard this in my spirit. Before you give up, choose faith. Before you give up, choose faith. And somebody says, Pastor, I feel so weak. I feel so useless. Put your hand to the last thing God told you to do. The reason why you haven't heard anything else is because you didn't fulfill the last assignment. He only gives one assignment at a time. I know you want four assignments and can pick and choose which one sounds better. But he only gives one assignment at a time. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Jesus said no one putting their hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. Stop looking back. That's over. It might have been great. Praise God if it was, but it's over. And if it was bad, why are you thinking about it anyway? Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Man, if I go see a movie and it was dumb, I'm not dwelling on the fact that I spent $12 on it. I tell my wife, that sucked. Let's go get some ice cream. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Forget those things which are behind and reach for those things which are ahead. Amen. Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. God has a prize for you, but you got to reach for it. Can you say amen? Are you encouraged this morning? Come on, give the Lord praise in this place. Hallelujah. God bless you guys. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, give the worship team a hand this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You may be seated. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, wonderful Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. Hallelujah. Just taking a look at you. You look great. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. I like your shirt. I am a man. I'm a man too. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, there it is. Receive that right now. That's the anointing coming on you. Receive that. Touch. That's it. 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 Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. See it right here? Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus. That's it. That's it. That's it. Touch. Jesus. Right through you. Right through you. Right through you. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I feel an anointing for families this morning. You got people believing God for their families. I feel an anointing for families this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to know, it doesn't matter how stubborn your loved one is, God's more stubborn. He has a stronger will. He's going to bring them in. He's going to bring them in. Hallelujah. Into the kingdom of God. Into joy and rejoicing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come here, Denise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Might need to help her. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. And I hear the Lord saying this, good job. Good job. Good job. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is it all right if God touches his people this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's somebody in here. You've had a strain on the left side of your neck. The Lord wants to heal you. Strain on the left side of your neck. Might be more than one. If that's you, come on up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand right here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when I lay hands on you, the pain's going to just, it's going to be like somebody wiped it away from a chalkboard. There it is. Healed in Jesus' name. There it goes. There it goes. In Jesus' name. Sorry, Jacob. Didn't mean to punch you in the face there. <laughs> Come on up. Same thing? On the right side. I'll take the right side too. Amen. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. Same thing as I lay my hand on you. It's going to be like, it's going to be like it's rubbed out. Healed. There we go. <laughs> there we go. It goes now. Yep. <laughs> there it goes. Jesus. <laughs> there it goes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There it goes. There it goes. Jesus. Jesus. There it goes. Yeah, move your neck. Work with that anointing. Cooperate with it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How's it feel, Miss Beverly? Yeah? It's gone? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Move your, tilt your head all the way over. There you go. All the way to the other side. There we go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. How's that? Yeah, it's loosening. Hallelujah. Stretch your hand out to her. Hook up in faith. Hallelujah. No spectators in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Participators. Hallelujah. I command every remnant of this strain to go. The pinched nerve to loosen. Loosen. In Jesus' name. Hey, there we go. There we go. There we go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Now, come on, don't be like regular American Christians. Come on, give the Lord praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
I've been in services, God opened a blind eye. People were like, come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. R.W. Schambach used to say, praise makes God want to do it again. Amen. 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 Praise makes God want to do it again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let me tell you what happened. As I was ministering to people, I felt a strain. This is how I knew. I felt a strain in my neck. And I was very aware of it. And I thought, that's strange. Now, I'm a little dense, so it takes me a little while sometimes, but it clicked in my spirit. Oh, the Lord's showing me somebody has that, because after I prayed for them, it's gone now. Sometimes the word of knowledge manifests that way. Brother Roberts, Oral Roberts used to have that. He'd know what somebody was dealing with because he'd start feeling it himself. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody says, why does God do that? I don't know. I'm just here to do what he says. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody, are we, can we just flow with the Holy Ghost? Yes. Somebody has a strain in their lower back. I'm not sure if it's your sciatic nerve or not. That's you. Come on up. There we go. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Is that you? Yeah. Line up. Shoulder to shoulder. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can somebody scoot the pulpit over a little? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, this isn't a gamble. It's not like the slot machines at the casino where you hope to hit lucky sevens and get healed. When I lay my hands on you, that pain's going to completely go. I want you to cooperate with that anointing. When I lay hands on you, I want you to begin to do what you couldn't do without pain. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. There we go. By the authority of the name of Jesus, be healed in Jesus' name. Right through you. Right through you. In Jesus' name. Through your whole spine, into your nervous system. Now, in the name of Jesus. Now begin to cooperate with that anointing. Bend over. Bend over. Bend forward. Hallelujah. Twist from side to side. There we go. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That goes right through you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How's that feel? Yeah? Hallelujah. Keep working with it. Hallelujah. Keep working with it. Hallelujah. (laughs) By the authority of the name of Jesus, be healed. There we go. There we go. I feel, I feel that. There we go. Bend forward. Twist from side to side. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. How does that feel? Is this loosening? Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Keep working with it. Cooperate with that anointing. In the name of Jesus, be healed. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now cooperate with it. Bend over from side to side. Don't hit Miss Ruth. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) By the authority of the name of Jesus, I command healing. There we go. Bend forward with me. Bend forward with me. There we go. There we go. Hallelujah. There we go. Loosening. Loosening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. By the authority of the name of Jesus, be Healed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now bend forward. Cooperate with that anointing. There we go. Bend forward more. Hallelujah. You can bend your knees, though. It's not a calisthenic. You don't have to touch your toes. I can't even do that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There we go. Yeah? 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 Come on. Give the Lord praise this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, I didn't have that planned. (laughs) 
It wasn't in the program. Amen. But it was in God's program. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Now, how did you know about the back, Pastor? Same thing. While I was telling you what happened with my neck, I started feeling in my back. I don't normally get a word of knowledge that way, but it worked that way today. Why, Pastor? I don't know. I don't know. I may never know. Or one day God might tell me. I don't know. Hallelujah. You know, you know the longer you walk with the Lord, the less questions you ask. But the more questions he answers. The longer you walk with the Lord, the less questions you ask, but the more questions he answers. And he'll answer a question. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, the day is soon coming here in the Inland Empire where no building will be able to hold the people. And when the Spirit of God gives a word for healing, it'll be impossible to lay hands on all the people. So you just command it, and the Spirit of God will go and do the work. In the Inland Empire. Not Africa, thank God for African Crusades. Not South America, thank God for South American Crusades. In the Inland Empire. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. 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 Some of you are wondering why they haven't torn down that auditorium, Orange Show Road, it's because it's going to be used for the gospel. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? It's going to be used for the gospel. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The uh, stadium in L.A., that they just built for the Los Angeles Rams. Five billion dollars. It's going to be used for the gospel. Amen. 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 I consider myself a, a student of revival. You begin to study the Welsh revival of the early 1900s. Secular accounts, not Christians, secular accounts tell us that they had to postpone sporting events because the people who were attending the sporting event would begin to sing a hymn during the game and the presence of God would start sweeping across the auditorium or the field. And people would start getting drunk in the Holy Ghost and falling out under the power. The players that were playing would start falling out on the field, just laying on their faces. The secular newspaper said they were overcome in a state of stupefaction. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think we need a lot of people nowadays to be overcome in a state of stupefaction. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. They had to shut down, during the Welsh revival of the early 1900s, they had to shut down the coal mines, which was the main source of income for that region. The majority of people were, uh, of the men were employed in the coal mines. And at this, obviously, early 1900s, they didn't have trucks and things like we do now, so they would use mules to pull carts. And in order to get the mules to go, to go the coal miners would use cuss words. So that was the commands that the mules would follow. Well, the 
revival swept over the coal mine. And all the coal miners got their tongue cleaned up. And so the coal miners refused to cuss. And because the coal miners refused to cuss, the mules wouldn't go anywhere. They'd just sit there. So they had to shut down the coal mine for several months to retrain the mules with different commands because the coal miners wouldn't cuss anymore. Hallelujah. Now, if God did that then, I know we don't have coal mines now, but we got people who cuss now. If God did that then, can he not do that now? Isn't he the same yesterday, today, and forever? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A man of God by the name of Duncan Campbell who was there for those revivals in his 80s, in the 1930s, they recorded him, he was in his 80s, talking about the revival in Welsh in the early 1900s. And in his thick Welsh accent, Duncan Campbell said, when God stepped down, suddenly men and women all over the parish were gripped by the fear of God. Not an evangelist, not any organized effort, but an awareness of God that captured the whole of Lewis. What was that, he said. Revival? Revival. Hallelujah. And if Jesus tarries, some of y'all are going to be in your 90s and say, when God stepped down, suddenly, men and women all over the Inland Empire were gripped by the fear of God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. That's what I'm believing for. You study accounts of the Welsh revival of the early 1900s and in the pubs and bars, the beer glasses were stuck to the tabletop. The men couldn't lift the beer glasses off the tabletop. And the conviction of the Holy Ghost would hit them. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm telling you. It won't be Few and far between the number of people that have a, a testimony of God gripping them. It's going to be multitudes. I remember saying this when we had a revival services before we started the church. Revival doesn't touch everyone. Revival touches every single one. Pastor, what's the difference? When you see, say everyone, it's a sea of faceless people. But to the Lord, every face is a soul, is a spirit, is a life. He knows every single person, and he'll grip them in the way they need. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's what I'm believing God for, for the Inland Empire. Amen. It's not going to be some hyped up thing where the who's who and the charismatic zoo all want to come and preach now because now the Inland Empire is the in place. No, if they want to come, they can, but you just sit and receive from the presence of God. No man's getting credit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just the Holy Ghost being who he is. God himself. The manifest presence of God. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you study the first great awakening in America in the 1700s, George Whitfield, who was a traveling evangelist, would preach in the 13 colonies. And he came to Philadelphia, and he preached there for two weeks. And in attendance among the thousands of others was Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin at the end of every service, would empty his pockets and give everything he had in the offering. And Benjamin Franklin said, I do suppose that if Mr. Whitfield is to stay much longer, I shall be a man on the streets with nothing left. Because every time he heard George Whitfield preach, he just gave everything. So there was one service where Benjamin Franklin had a young man that worked for him, and he took all of his money, and he gave it to the young man. And he said, hold on to this for me, because if I hold on to it, I'll give it all in the offering. George Whitfield preached for two hours. Benjamin Franklin was dissolved into tears. His eyes were closed as he could feel the presence of God. He opened his eyes in the midst of a tumult of people crying out to the Lord, and he looked to his right, and the young man was missing. So he begins to look around. What happened to this young man, my employee, the one that works for me? He's looking around. He can't see him. He looks up over the crowd, and the young man is putting something in the offering. (laughs) He returns back to Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin says, what have you done? The young man said, if you couldn't hold on to your own money, what makes you think I'd hold on to it? And he put all of Benjamin Franklin's money in the offering. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not telling you to go into your neighbor's purse this morning. But when the power of God gets a hold of people, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. And so it won't be little drips here of the power of God, a little drip here of the power of God. It's going to be a deluge. In the canyons of Arizona, if you go hiking in these canyons, before you enter into the canyons, you'll come across multiple signs that warn of flash floods because the rains will come suddenly and you weren't expecting it and the next thing you hear is the last thing you hear the rains coming around the corner and they sweep many people have died in those canyons they get swept up by a flash flood well I believe there's coming a flash flood of the presence of God hallelujah where we weren't expecting it. I'm the sign that keeps telling you it's going to happen. Hallelujah. Well, yeah, pastor keeps talking about a revival. He keeps talking about the Inland Empire being shaken, but we'll see if it happens or not. I'm telling you, a flash flood of the Holy Ghost is going to, hallelujah, is going to fill the Inland Empire. Glory to God. Glory to God. Can you say amen? Amen. He's going to turn gangsters into preachers. He's going to turn prostitutes into prayer warriors. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Amen. (laughs) He's going to turn pimps into pastors. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I don't know. I just feel like prophesying today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I've said this many times, and it bears repeating. I'm not here thinking we're going to be the only church moving with the Holy Ghost like that. We might be the first, 
But God's going to do a work in the churches in the Inland Empire. There will be a multitude of houses of worship where people can take their pick. The Holy Ghost is moving. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. So this isn't about me and in truth and triumph gets all the credit. But no. How many of you have heard of, not Oral Roberts, how many of you have heard of Evan Roberts? Three people. Evan Roberts was the one who started the Welsh Revival. But very few people know that because the presence of God just took over. And so people know what happened in the Welsh Revival, but many people don't even know who started it. It started with a young man named Evan Roberts. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There was a... Uh, <clears throat> There was a poem that came out of the Welsh Revival. And sometimes I'll just say it to myself because I feel the Holy Ghost when I say it and I get a little drunk. And the poem out of the Welsh Revival goes like this. It, it says, uh, The darkened world around me rage. I'm sorry. The darkened world around me sage. They think I'm mad. Or drunk with rage. Drunken, yes, I'm drunk and odd, but drunken with the wine of God. Woo! <laughs> the darkened world around me, sage, thinks I'm mad or drunk with rage. Drunken, yes, I'm drunk and odd, but drunken with the wine of God. Every time I say it, I feel like I'm taking a drink. <laughs> oh, man. Great days are ahead. The greatest move of God is not behind us. The greatest move of God is right ahead of us. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My dean in Bible school tells a story. He was a pastor in Tulsa before, uh, whew, shouldn't have told that poem. <laughs> he was a pastor in Tulsa, Oklahoma before, long before he was dean of our Bible school. Well, one year he took a trip to Israel just by himself and he went to the markets, and of course, they're pretty smart out there, and they know Christians get really excited for trinkets. And so in the markets, he was able to find a shofar. Now, what a lot of people call shofars nowadays are actually African kudu horns. They're not real shofars. But he got a real shofar. And he brought it back from Israel. His first service back at the church was a midweek service. But it was more attended than normal because he had been gone for a few weeks. Everybody wanted to see pastor. So, so he was, it was a highly attended midweek service. But because it was a midweek service, they didn't have a full band. So he was just on the piano leading worship. And uh, he had the shofar. He had put it on top of the keyboard. Well, after worship, he began to, excuse me, he began to minister and he began to preach on the coming of the Lord. The second coming. And as he was ministering, the power of God was sweeping over that place, just touching people. He said it was like heaven entered into that room. He said it was so powerful, people were just caught up in the Holy Ghost. He said there wasn't an open eye in the place, and I didn't have to tell anyone to close their eyes. Everyone was just overwhelmed in the presence of God. He said there were shouts of joy, there was weeping, there was laughing, it was wonderful. He said, and he became so enraptured in that presence that he jumped up on stage and he grabbed that shofar and he blew in it. Well, everyone's eyes in the place were closed. And he just got done preaching on the coming of the Lord. So when he blew in that shofar, 
Everyone, no one saw him on stage. Everyone looks up and they go, it's happening, it's happening. He said people were climbing on the chairs. They didn't know what to do. Everyone was looking up with their hands lifted. And he said after a few minutes, the excitement turned into terror because they'd always heard it was supposed to happen in the twinkling of an eye and it hadn't happened yet. They're still in their seats. Everyone in the church thought they missed the rapture. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> but I tell you that this morning. Because this move that's going to happen in the Inland Empire, it's not going to crest to a peak and then die back down and then the Inland Empire go back to the way it was and eventually the coming of the Lord. I believe that the Inland Empire is going to be part of the last day move of God. And at the height of this move, the coming of the Lord. Can you say amen? amen? So don't be shocked if you're in the house of God, overcome by the presence of God. And the next thing you know, you're in a glorified body, looking Him in the eyes, whose face shines like the sun in its strength whose eyes are a flame of fire, whose hair is white like wool, whose feet are like brass refined in the fire, whose voice is as the sound of many waters. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> I feel the Holy Ghost in here this morning. Hallelujah. I see Sarah trying to hold it together. And take pictures. She's doing a terrible job holding it together. Great job with the pictures. Terrible job holding it together. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just let God touch His people this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Whew. Whew. <laughs> Whew. <laughs> Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Some people laugh like villains from a Disney movie, but that doesn't mean God's not touching them. Amen. Just because they laugh like Jafar doesn't mean God's not touching them. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I feel the fire of God in here right now. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There it is. There it is. Let that go right through you. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Joy. That's it. That's it. 
<laughs> Your stomach hurts because you haven't used those muscles in a while. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I don't know about you, but I don't want anything except the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? Nothing but the Holy Ghost. I... I don't want to build a church on man's comfort. I want to build a church making room for the Holy Ghost. And if the Holy Ghost makes man uncomfortable, but he's my best friend. He's my best friend. His voice, just the sound of his voice means so much to me. If some woman were to hit on me, I would make it very clear I belong to somebody. Amen. She's my wife. I'll make it so clear that they never try to do that again. Because my wife means too much to me. How much more the Holy Ghost? Amen. How much more the Holy Ghost? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I just want the Holy Ghost. I want the Holy Ghost in fire. Hallelujah. 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 You know, that was the secret to Catherine Coleman's ministry. All she wanted was the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love talking to Mr. Terry because he was in her services. 
And he told me about, I, I, I wish I could have been in her services. And he told me about the wind of God sweeping over that place. Hallelujah. But you know what? I have the same Holy Ghost Catherine Coleman did. We can have the wind of God. I have the same Holy Ghost John G. Lake did. I have the same Holy Ghost Evan Roberts did. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Same Holy Ghost Kenneth Hagin had. Amen. Same Holy Ghost Oral Roberts had. A.A. A. Allen. Jack Coe. Hallelujah. Charles Finney. Peter Cartwright. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. So you know, I'm not just standing here because I don't have a message. I actually have a message. <laughs> but I, I don't feel the release to move on yet. I don't feel the release to move on yet. People get nervous in church when the preacher's not saying anything. The Holy Ghost is saying something. I feel like I'm, like I'm standing under a waterfall. The presence of God. How many just sense the presence of God right now? Hallelujah. It's precious. It's precious.
Somebody says, this is the weirdest church I've ever been to. And we just value the presence of God. We value the Holy Ghost. We value the anointing. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Say this with me. There's nothing more precious than the presence of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, in the natural, it seems like we're just sitting quietly. But you're going to find out God was doing some things this morning. Just while you were sitting under the anointing, God's just... Amen. I remember, and this was not that long ago, I believe it was either last year or late 2020, the Lord spoke to me and he said, he said, you've learned how to wait on my presence. Now you need to learn how to wait in my presence. Amen. I, I had a tendency, I knew how to press in, Till the presence of God came, and then it came. I was like, okay, I'm good. And I had to learn. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is many Christians can't pray in the Holy Ghost for more than five minutes without something distracting them. Just because our society has become more distracting and louder, that doesn't mean God has changed the way he operates. Amen. You come into his way of operating. So you have to learn how to set aside every other voice. You have to learn how to get into his presence. You have to learn how to value what he says. And can I tell you how you learn how to value what he says? By doing it. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning. Please don't un unplug just because we're getting in the Word. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs. The 29th chapter. I'm continuing along the lines that I started on last Sunday, which was achieving God's best. Amen. Amen. How many in here don't want any less than God's best? Three of you, that's phenomenal. How many of you in here don't want any less than God's best? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And when the Lord spoke to me about what to minister today, he's taken me along the lines of the same subject, achieving God's best, but he's taken me a direction I didn't expect. Amen. Amen. Proverbs chapter 29. 
and verse 15. Say amen when you're there. The rod and reproof give wisdom. Amen. So we're going to be spanking everybody this morning. (laughs) Just kidding. Just kidding. Go down to verse 18 with me. Verse 18. There was no significance of me reading verse 15. That was just a joke. Verse 18. Proverbs 29 and verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keeps, other translations say obey the law, happy is he or she. Can you say amen? Amen. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keeps or obeys the law, or you can say the word, happy is he or she. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about the importance of being tied into a vision. Because I'm here to tell you today that you cannot achieve God's best for your life when you are isolated. It is impossible for you to become what God has called you to be separated from the body of Christ. There are no mavericks in the kingdom of God. I know Tom Cruise made it look cool in the 90s in Top Gun. It was cool to be a maverick doing your own thing. But in the kingdom of God, the Bible tells us in Psalm 125... How precious it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious anointing oil poured over the head of Aaron, dripping down his beards under his garments. For there, everybody say there. There the Lord has commanded the blessing. Can you say amen? And so achieving God's best in your life is vitally tied to how connected you are to the body of Christ. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, can the ear say to the eye, I have no need of you? If there were no ear, where would the hearing be? And if there were no eye, where would the seeing be? Now here's something interesting. That Number one, the fact that when Paul called the church the body of Christ, he was being literal. That just as a body, a physical body, is many members but one body, so you and I are members of the body of Christ. Now, if a member is cut off from the body, the body suffers because of the lack of that member. But that member doesn't suffer, that member is dead. Oh, I'm going to say that again. If a member, if a finger, for, for instance, is cut off from the body, the body is hurt. The body is, is hindered because of the, that missing member. Amen. But the finger is not hurt because it's missing from the body. The finger is without life. It is dead. It is useless. Can you say amen? And there's a lot of people in, in the church who are not connected to the body. Now, I'm not just talking this morning in reference to church attendance, though that is part of it. But there are many people whose rear ends are in a seat in a church on Sunday, but they are not connected to anything. Amen. Now, the church and the preaching of the word, Christianity, is not about making you a better person. You need to understand that this morning. Christianity is not about behavioral modification. Christianity, Jesus didn't die on the cross to make you nicer. Jesus didn't die on the cross to make you more polite. Now, when you get saved, you might be nicer, depending on how mean you were. And when you get saved, you might be more polite. But that was not the purpose of the precious blood of the Son of the living God. That was not the purpose of His blood being shed. Can you say amen? 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that when you get saved, whether it be somebody coming up to you and preaching the gospel and you bowing your head with them and repeating the prayer of salvation, or you came down the aisle in a church service and you confessed the Lord Jesus in front of the presence of many witnesses, however you got saved, when you got saved, something happened. Turn to your neighbor and say, something happened. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 6, it says that the elementary doctrines of Christ are repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, plural, of the laying on of hands, of the resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment. And so you need to know this morning, there are more than one baptism. When you say baptism, most people think baptized in water. If you're Pentecostal, you'll probably think, the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Amen. But did you know that when you got saved, the moment you gave your life to the Lord, did you know you got baptized? The Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us, baptizes us into the body. In other words, before you ever got saved, the Spirit of God had already in his mind determined the best place for you to fit within the body of Christ. Immediately when you got saved, God had connection in mind. Can you say amen? Now, if the church is represented by a body, what happens to a body that does nothing? Is a, a, a person who goes nowhere, does nothing, are they healthy? Their muscles begin to develop atrophy, right? Their cells begin to die. Diseases begin to set in. Because the body was created for movement. The body was created for activity. Can you say amen? There is a reason why this verse in Proverbs 29 verse 18 does not say without a dream the people perish. Because a lot of people have dreams. They have things they'd like to do. It says without a vision, something set before you, something to pursue. Without a vision, the people perish. There are a lot of churches, individual houses of worship today in America that are dying because that house has no vision. Amen. And so they have people that show up, they have people that give, but the church itself is going nowhere. Then there's a lot of churches that have things they want to accomplish, but the people in the place are not tied into the vision. And so they're spectators in what God has called that church to do. Well, won't that be great when that finally happens? But you need to understand this morning, you are part of the body. There is nowhere my feet can take me that my hands do not go. Amen. I didn't leave my hands at home this morning because they didn't feel like waking up. I didn't leave my nose at home this morning because it didn't feel like waking up. Where the body goes, every member of the body follows. Can you say amen? And so you need to understand this morning, and, and I pray that God would minister this to your spirit. That this church would not be merely where you go to church. Where do you go to church? Oh, truth and triumph. But that you would be connected. You would be tied in to what God has in store for this body. And I'm here to tell you this morning that that is the key to achieving God's best in your life. You will never achieve the highest thing that God has for you disconnected. You have to be tied in to the body. Can you say amen? If one part of the body is blessed, the whole body is blessed. Hallelujah. So notice it says that without vision, the people perish. But, everybody say but. He that keeps or obeys the word, happy is he or she. It's not just a matter 
like I said, of having something you want to do because a dream is what you would like to happen. A vision has to be actively pursued. Amen. And I'm here to tell you this morning that actively being part of a vision is the key to seeing breakthrough in every area of your life. I've laid hands on, I mean, since we've started the church, I've laid hands on people before we started the church, but just since we've started the church, no exaggeration, I've laid hands on hundreds of people for healing. And I've noticed something over the course of my time ministering to people. Now, this isn't the case with everybody, but it has been the case a handful of times. That oftentimes... A reason why somebody may not get healed is because they have no vision that they're tied into. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. The Bible tells us that there is a difference between hope and faith. How many knew that? God did not confuse his language. He didn't confuse his wording when he used hope. And he didn't confuse his language or his wording when he used faith. He said faith when he meant faith. And he said hope when he meant hope. Can you say amen? Now, hope, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, many of you have heard me say this before, hope is looking forward. It is something that you're pursuing. It's something, you're be- it's something that you're wanting to take place. It's a promise that's been placed on your life. Amen. I'll give you an example. All of us are hoping for the coming of the Lord. Now, you need to, you need to differentiate in your mind from hope the way the world uses it and hope the way the Bible means it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, hope, the hope that comes from God, does not disappoint. So when the world says hope, the world is talking about Jiminy Cricket, wish upon a star. Are you going to get that promotion? I hope so. But when the Bible says hope, it is a guarantee it's just a matter of time. So when I say we are hoping for the coming of the Lord, that doesn't mean I'm saying as the body of Christ, you know, that'd be great if it happens. I I wish it would happen. No, we know the coming of the Lord is going to take place. It's just a matter of time. Can you say amen? But the Bible also tells us in in Hebrews chapter 11 that faith, say faith, faith, faith is the substance of the things you were hoping for. Now, What gets you healed, hope or faith? You seemed unsure about that answer. What what gets you healed, hope or faith? Brother Hagin used to say all the time, he'd pray for people, for God to heal them, and then he'd ask them afterwards, are you healed? And they'd say, I hope so. And he says, well, you won't be, because you're hoping and I'm believing, he'd say. Amen. Amen. However, hope is a vital ingredient of effective faith. Many people don't receive healing in their body because whether they would admit it verbally or not, whether they're even aware of it or not, in their heart they have no vision they're pursuing. They have no future in mind. There's not something they're tied into. There's not something they're trying to accomplish with their life. They don't really see the purpose for them drawing breath here on the earth. So they don't want to die, but they don't really know why they're alive. They don't want to die. Pray for me, Pastor. I don't want to die. But they're not really living for anything. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And please turn quickly. Quicker than me, because I'm taking forever. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And verse 16, say amen when you're there. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, Paul said. For necessity, everybody say necessity. Necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. 
Having a vision for your life is not something that, oh, that'd be nice if that happened. Having a vision is, woe is me if this does not happen. Oh, you missed that. Having a vision for your life is not, this would be nice if this happened. Having a vision for your life is, what are you so tied to? What is your faith so connected to? What are you so desiring for your life that woe is me if it does not happen? Paul said, I have nothing to glory of. There's no reason to pat me on the back for all the great things that have happened in my ministry because I'm doing it out of necessity. There is a burden laid on me to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And so if we reach, when we reach 10,000 members in this church, that's not something for us to pat ourselves on the back about because the burden is the Inland Empire. The vision is the Inland Empire. So I'm not stopping because somebody does some documentary on the church as to how big we've grown or, or people are documenting the miracles that have taken place. That's nothing to glory in. Of necessity, I am pursuing a vision for my life. And without vision, the people perish. What causes churches to slip over into watered-down, lukewarm Christianity, their vision is too small. The goal was too small. The prize was too small. And they hit it, and when they hit it, they didn't know what to do anymore. So now it's no longer about pursuing, it's about maintaining. Well, now we've hit 10,000 members. Now we just need to maintain our membership. Absolutely not. Woe is me if the Inland Empire is not shaken by the mighty hand of God. Can you say amen? Amen. Woe is me if this vision for my life is not fulfilled. Now, if God has called you to a church, He's not called you to a seat to plant your butt on and you get mad when a newcomer is sitting in your seat on Sunday. Excuse me, sir, that's my seat. Sit somewhere else. Can you say amen? God didn't call you to a church because he had a seat in mind. God called you to a church because he had a vision in mind. And many of you are wondering, what's the vision for my life? It's probably to fulfill the vision of this church. Amen. Well, I I really don't know what my purpose is. Tie into the vision of a church. You're connected to a body. Imagine your finger saying, I really don't know what I'm here for. To help the rest of the body. Could you imagine laying at three in the morning, your finger, are you awake? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, Mr. Finger, what's wrong? Oh, I just don't know what I'm here for. (laughs) This is not talked about, but depression is running rampant in the church. Can I tell you what causes a Christian to be depressed? They're not tied to a vision. They don't know what they're here for. That's actually why church hurt hurts so bad. Because in many cases, people were tied to a vision. And something happened that injured them. And so, not in a bad way, but it's almost a soul tie. When they get hurt by a church or a ministry, and there's a break there because they were actually tied into the vision. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to cause offense. He wants to cause division. To divide you from the vision. And so people leave a church and then they come to a new one. And the problem is they don't want to tie into the vision of the new church because of the division at the old one. But I'm here to tell you, don't allow the enemy to cause you to hold back from tying in completely because of what happened before. Can you say amen? Amen. You are called to be a part of a vision in a body that is pursuing the kingdom of God being expanded here on the earth. Can you say amen? 
And so achieving God's best for your life is not just you walking in prosperity, though I want you prosperous. God wants you prosperous. Achieving God's best for your life is not just walking in total health, though I want you healthy. God wants you healthy. Beloved, I desire above all things that you prosper and be in health. Finish it for me, Bible scholars. Even as your soul prospers. That's the will of God for your life. But the purpose of that prosperity, both financially and in your soul, the purpose of your health, both spiritually and physically, is so you can be useful in a vision. So what in your life is your woe is me if not? Woe is me if I don't get up for work on Monday? Come on. Woe is me if my children don't call me on Thursday? Work is important. It's good to have your children call you. All of you should call your moms and dads if you can after this service and tell them you love them. But the woe is me if not should be the vision that you're tied to. Notice it doesn't say where there is no vision, the person perishes. It says where there is no vision, the people perish. God sets a singular vision for a group, for a body of people. Can you say amen? I want you to consider this this morning. At 16 years old, and I feel like I bring him up a lot, but I guess he's worth bringing up because his star is the symbol on the flag of Israel. But at 16 years old, David was anointed king. At that moment, David's vision became to be seated on the throne over Israel and to lead God's people. Between the time he was anointed by the prophet Samuel until the time he took that throne, it was another 16 years. But in the wilderness, while he was fleeing from Saul who wanted to kill him, the Bible says, and I talked about it on Wednesday for those of you that were here, the Bible says that vagabonds and criminals came to David. You're anointed king, and God brings you vagabonds and criminals? That's not exactly the PR you want as a king. Can you say amen? He's a king. He's hanging out with criminals. That guy robbed my grandmother, and he's hanging out with David. But there in the wilderness for that 16 years, the anointing that was on David's life it rubbed off on all those vagabonds and criminals. And when David took the throne, those vagabonds and criminals became David's mighty men. David had a special ops. And it was the men that God brought to him in the wilderness. But now, 16 years later, David takes the throne. And he is dominating all of the enemies of Israel, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, and all the other ites are getting their rear end kicked by David. The Philistines, David would kill a few hundred Philistines before breakfast. I mean, he was dominating all the enemies of Israel. The problem was, David had no vision beyond taking the throne. And so David got bored with battle. What happened when David got bored with battle? Come on, don't take my punchline. <laughs> In the time, the Bible says, when kings should be at war, David was at home. And he's just chilling on the rooftop of his palace. And he sees a woman taking a bath. Her name is Bathsheba. How appropriate. And, and, yet, and yet inappropriate. 
And when David saw her, he desired her. Why was he so moved by his desire for Bathsheba? Because he wasn't desiring anything else. His vision was too small. See, here's the amazing thing, is that God can anoint you, but that doesn't mean you have a vision yet. I got hit by the fire of God on January 10th, 2009. I didn't know what I was going to be doing. I knew I was called to the ministry. I knew I didn't want a pastor. <laughs> it's true. I had an anointing. I would win souls. I would lay hands on people. I'd baptize people in the Holy Ghost. I traveled to other churches. I was a missionary for two years to the Philippines with my parents. I left the mission field and started, you know, hanging out with Mariah because she couldn't keep her hands off me. <laughs> you think I'm joking? The, the girls, Ruby and Crystal, just had the school banquet. And uh, they sent us pictures. And so we sent them pictures from when Mariah and I went to banquet. And Mariah's hands are all over me. And Ruby said, well, now we have photo proof that Mariah couldn't keep her hands off you. <laughs> Amen. So I was like, all right, I'll marry you. No, it was more like, please marry me, please. <laughs> Amen. So I had an anointing, but I had no vision. I had to press in for the vision. Amen. Amen. And not only for the vision, but how the vision is supposed to be fulfilled. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. David, his only vision, he had the anointing. He knew how to walk in that anointing. That's why he dominated all of his enemies, starting with Goliath. And no man was able to stand before David. He had an anointing, but he had no vision. So that's why he was so moved by his desire for Bathsheba. Those of you who have read the story, you know he desired her so greatly, he took her into his palace and he laid with her. And she became pregnant. And like many stupid men, after the fact, David said, what have I done? Amen. So now David finds out who Bathsheba's husband is, Uriah. Not our Uriah, different Uriah. <laughs> if a girl comes named Bathsheba, just tell her no just right off the bat. Amen. <laughs> Miss Beverly. Finds out who Bathsheba's husband is, Uriah. He's a soldier. David takes him off the battlefield, brings him into the palace, gives him a feast, says, you're such a faithful warrior, we just wanted to reward you. Gets the man drunk. And then sends him home, hoping that the fact that he was at war and drunk would make him sleep with his wife. So that way, his wife, when it showed she was pregnant, David could say, yeah, it's Uriah's. But Uriah, even when he was drunk, was faithful. And he wouldn't even go into his house. He slept on the doorstep of his house. So now David says, well... Now I have to kill Uriah. So that way, when I tell everyone, oh yeah, when I called Uriah off the battlefield, he went and slept with his wife. That way Uriah's dead. He can't tell everybody that I'm lying. So he sends Uriah onto the battlefield and gives instruction to his general. He says, at the heat of the battle, pull everyone off the field and leave Uriah by himself to guarantee he'll be killed. His general said, why would we do that? David said, just do it. Uriah's killed. And David thinks he's in the clear. And God sends a prophet. Those pesky prophets. <laughs> you know what people don't like about prophets? They're pesky. They won't shut up. They won't let you do what you want to do. When all the other false prophets are saying, yeah, go to battle, you'll win, the other prophet says, no, you're going to die. That's a different story in the Bible. Amen. God sends a prophet by the name of Nathan and says, David, I want to tell you something that happened. 
David says, tell me. The prophet Nathan says, there was a man here in Israel who had a sheep, and he loved this sheep. He cherished this sheep. He protected and nourished this sheep. And another man, more powerful and more wealthy than this man, took this man's sheep and killed the man. And David, with an intrinsic value for justice, because despite his mistake, he was still a man after God's own heart, stood up from his throne and said, Who did this? I'll have him killed before the sun sets. And Nathan, whoo, you got to be filled with the anointing to say this to a king. Nathan says, you are the man. And the fear of God grips David. David collapses on his throne. And Nathan says, thus saith the Lord, when you were the least in your father's house, and your father's house the least in Israel, meaning you were the lowest of the low, your own family didn't like you, and no one liked your family. I raised you up and made you king, and I have caused all of your enemies to be subdued by your hand, and I brought you riches and wealth and honor, God said, and if that wasn't enough, God says through the prophet Nathan, I would have given you much more. How then can you do this to me, God said? David got himself in trouble because he had no vision. If you follow the train of events, David's mistake with Bathsheba, his sin with Bathsheba, led to the division of his kingdom with Absalom. You get yourself in trouble when you pursue something without a vision. Can you say amen? Amen. And we see turmoil in David's kingdom for years. But then finally, about 15 years before David dies, he had repented of his sin with Bathsheba. God had restored the kingdom after his son Absalom had split it from him. And David's praying in the tabernacle. And as usual, he feels the presence of God while he's praying. And he decides, how can I live in a fashioned home and my God dwell in a tent? I'm going to build God a house. Now, God speaks to David and says, because your hands have blood on them. In other words, you're a man of war. You cannot build me a house. David says, if I can't build it then I'll pay for it. And for the last 15 years of David's life, he has a vision. What's his vision? Build God a house. It was a vision so great, it was carried on into the next generation. Can you say amen? And that vision to build God a house for the remainder of David's years, it kept him narrow on the path of righteousness. I'll prove it to you. The Bible says that shortly after David got the vision to build God a house, he put away all of his wives. Clearly, David had a problem with women. But when he got a vision... He had no time for that. He was pursuing something. Can you say amen? I believe one reason why many marriages fail is because the families don't have a vision. We're married and then what? The, the dating stage is so exciting because the next stage is engagement. The engagement is so exciting because the next stage is the wedding. You finally get married and you're in a state of, of stupefaction and you're so happy to be together because you finally achieved your vision, but that wears off after a few years. What's your vision after that? I believe one of the keys, and I'm not patting myself on the back this morning, I'm just being honest with you. I believe one of the keys to my wife and I's marriage is we have a vision. 
It's this church. We pursue it together. We're believing God together to shake the Inland Empire. We're believing God together for my daughter to be a mighty woman of God. We're believing God together for my son to be a prophet of God like the Lord had spoken. We're believing together we have a vision. And many families fail because the family doesn't have a vision. They get up and go to work. They come home and reluctantly play with their children, put them to bed so they can watch TV for an hour, go to sleep, and start it all over again. And they have nothing they're pursuing, nothing they're living for. Can you say amen? Many people die before their time because the only vision they had for their life was retirement. Amen. Now, you might retire from the world, but you don't retire from the kingdom. The kingdom of God still has something for you to do. Can you say there's something for you to pursue? And when you're retired, you just have more time to do it. Can you say amen? Praying people, people who have a prayer life. I'm not talking about now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, tell my husband not to eat my cake. I'm not talking about that kind of prayer life. I'm talking about, I'm talking about you're a prayer. Praying people live long because God gives praying people prayer assignments. So all, there's always something that they're pursuing, even if it's in the spirit only. They have something they're pursuing. But oftentimes, even people who pray are not tied into a vision. So their prayers are all over the place. We are a body. We are connected to one another. If you wonder, well, I don't even know what I'm here for. I promise you, you are here in one form or fashion to fulfill the vision of a house. And if this is the house God has called you to, your purpose is tied to this house. Your vision is tied to this house. We don't have some small vision to see 200 people in this sanctuary. We don't have some small vision to be the biggest church in San Bernardino. Who gives a flip about that? And I said flip because we're in church. We have a vision to see the Inland Empire shaken by the mighty hand of God. And we're going to do it one person at a time. That's why I ask God, I want a thousand daisies. I want a thousand conos. I want a thousand Phillips, even when he's sleeping. I want a thousand Willis's. I want a thousand Denise's. Hallelujah. I want, a th- I want 10,000 people with fruit in their lives. I want 10,000 Marks and 10,000 Connie's. Hallelujah. I want 10,000 Sarah's. I want, I, I, want t- I want God to shake this region by his mighty power. It's not about church attendance. Not butts in seats, God. Hearts on fire. Hearts on fire. I want 100,000 crystals and 100,000 rubies who are willing to step out of their comfort zone to become who God has called them to be. I can't wait till they come back to us because they're going to be lit ablaze and I'm going to set them loose. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. So what is your, woe is me this morning? Woe is me if I don't get my retirement? Woe is me if I don't get my paycheck? What's your woe is me? Because Paul said of a necessity. What is the necessity of your life? And is it tied into eternity? Because if it's not tied into eternity, my friend, it's worthless. It's vanity. Only eternity matters. Only eternity matters. Say that with me this morning. Only eternity matters. Hallelujah. Only eternity matters. Many of you are beginning to step out. And be soul winners in your day-to-day life. 
getting testimonies and texts and messages one after another of people. I won this person to the Lord and God did this. I won this person. They were shaken under the power. I won this person. They started crying. I won this person. They were so happy. You're tying into the vision. You're tying into the vision. Because one by one by one by one by one, we're going to shake the Inland Empire. Now, I told you the poem from the Welsh Revival. There was another poem that came out of the First Great Awakening that the band Leland actually turned into a song. The song is called Great Awakening. And it goes like this. One man wakes and awakens another. The second one wakes his next door brother. Three awake can rouse a town and turn the city upside down. So we were waking people up. One by one by one by one. We're waking people up. Can you say amen? There's a lot of, and let me tell you this this morning. There's a lot of people that think they're on fire for God, but they're not on fire for God. There's a difference between excitement and fire. Now, don't get me wrong. Fire gets you excited. But excitement in and of itself is not fire. The way you know the fire of God has grabbed a hold of you is there is a definitive moment. If I were to hold a match up this morning and strike it against this pulpit, it might not light because this thing has a lot of wax on it, but if I were to strike it against this pulpit and it lit, there was a moment when that match was not on fire, though it was created for fire, it is not on fire. And then there's a moment where it is ignited. Can you say amen? You were created for fire. You were created to burn with the fire of God. Think about this this morning. Where there's no vision. What is vision? In its simplest form, vision is the ability to see. Can you see in darkness? You can't see in darkness. What does fire do? It illuminates. Many people are not tied into a vision because they have no fire. They can't see. So you can preach vision to them all day long, but they're in darkness. There's no fire. You got to get them lit up with the fire of God. And all of a sudden, the Bible says the eyes of their understanding will become enlightened. And oh, now I know the hope to which he has called me. And how rich his glorious inheritance is in me as a saint, his set apart one. Now I know the exceeding greatness of his power in and for me. Because I believe in the demonstrating of the working of his mighty strength when he worked it in Christ. And raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age and in this world but also in the age and the world which are to come and he has placed all things under his feet and have given him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body why are Jesus' eyes like a flame of fire God has a vision if even beyond the age of this earth. We read about it last Sunday in the offering message. You thought I was just taking an offering. No, I'm telling you, God is a God who has a vision even to the ends of eternity. After this earth, there comes a new heaven and a new earth. Oh, by the way, he creates the new heavens and the new, and the new earth by fire. Can you say amen? So I'm telling you this morning. The way you find what your woe is me is. I know that makes no sense in the English language, but stick with me. The way you find what your necessity is, the way you find what your vision is, is you get lit up with the fire of God. Can you say amen? When you get ignited with the fire... That vision will keep you up at night. It'll wake you up in the morning. 
Let me tell you something. A vision that God gives you is disturbing. It's disturbing. It disturbs everything. It disturbs everything. My mom had a vision for me. God spoke to her. And he said, raise your son like a minister. She said, God, I've never been in ministry. The Lord said, I'll show you. And he took her to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Speak to your children in their rising up and in their lying down. Speak to them in their going forth and in their return. Speak to them when they are waking and speak to them when they are sleeping. So we'd be in the car together. And I'd be like, Mom, there's a, there's a new tech deck I want to buy. If you grew up in the 90s, you know tech decks were the little finger skateboards. I was terrible at them. But we'd be in the car together. Mom, there's a new tech deck I want to buy. And my mom would say, do you know what the Lord was saying to me the other day? Mom, we're not talking about the Lord. We're talking about tech decks. She'd ignore me. The Lord was saying to me that this is what he's going to do in this final hour. She'd begin to talk to me about the things of God. You know, I was praying the other day, and the Spirit of God said this to me. Before we went to bed, she'd read me the Bible. King James. Must be why I preach out of it now. Amen. She had a vision for my life. And now, you can ask her when she comes over. Now I say, you know what the Lord was saying to me the other day? You know I was praying and the Spirit of God spoke to me and this is what he said. You know I was reading this scripture and God showed this to me. You know, it worked. You know what's interesting? Train up a child in the way they should go. The problem is to go somewhere you have to have a direction. So many people, they train up their children, but there's no vision. There's no vision. Can I tell you something, parents and grandparents? Because some of you grandparents are the only godly influence in your grandchildren's lives. But God will use you for them. Can I tell you something? At a young age, God is already speaking to those little children what they're supposed to do with their lives. It is your job to reinforce them in it and to train them in it. Can you say amen? How many of you have heard of the show Superbook? It is a children's program created by CBN, Christian Broadcasting Network. Thank God for Pat Robertson. Amen. And Mariah and I downloaded it because Mariah found it on YouTube and they only had so many episodes. So we downloaded the app and it has a bunch of episodes. I'm telling you, I'm going somewhere with this. Just stick with me. I'm telling you that show is so anointed. It's a cartoon. But I'm like sitting there weeping because they're quoting scripture. I love how faithful and accurate that show is to the Bible, minus the time-traveling children and the artificially intelligent robot. (laughs) But the rest of it. Uh, One of my favorite episodes is Nebuchadnezzar's dream, where he has the dream of the statue, and Daniel prays and interprets it for him. I watch that episode, and I'm weeping. Now, when we first started putting that show on for Eliana, she didn't want to watch that. She wanted to watch Ralph Breaks the Internet. She wanted to watch Beauty and the Beast. But it started feeding her spirit. And that's how Mariah started presenting it to her. She'd say, baby, we're not going to watch Disney right now. We're going to feed our hearts. And she'd put on Superbook. And now, Eliana will tell us, I have to feed my heart. And we put on that show. And I'll be sitting there with her, and I'm crying, and she'll wipe my tears. It's okay, Daddy. Now, she'll hear me say all the time, Jesus is wonderful. I walk around the house, Jesus is wonderful. 
And the other day, we were sitting watching the episode of The Miracles of Jesus. And I'm sitting there watching the show crying. And Eliana goes, Daddy, Jesus is wonderful. <laughs> Mariah was at the park the other day with Eliana. Eliana makes friends so easy. I am terrible at making friends. <laughs> I'm awful at it. That's why I have my wife and my friend Sam. That's about it. I got it. <laughs> And Mariah, she's as friendly as can be, but Mariah's not really that great at making friends either. Eliana, she walks up to people. Um, my name's Eliana. What's your name? That's my daddy and my mommy and my Grammy and my poppy. And then she just starts telling, and then makes friends. So Mariah was at the park the other day, and there was this little girl. And the two little girls, Eliana and this little girl, they're sitting there, and they're pulling blades of grass. And Eliana says, I want to tell you about the word of God. And she starts talking to this little girl about the word of God. That was me. I was three years old. I stood up in a Payless shoe store. When I got arrested at the theater, that wasn't my first time standing up somewhere. <laughs> I stood up in a Payless shoe store and said, people, let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> and now here's Eliana. I want to tell you about the word of God. Have a vision for your family. And you can tie that vision into the vision of your church so that your children learn how to be connected into the body. Can you say amen? Achieving God's best for your life has to be tied in to your purpose. Why am I here? Because if you haven't understood it by now. I preach prosperity, but I preach prosperity with a purpose. Because many people, they get born again, or they begin to seek God to provide for them when they're in debt, when they're in foreclosure, when they're about to go bankrupt, when they're homeless, and they don't know what else to do, and God raises them up out of the dunghill, and when he would set them among royalty, instead they settle for middle class. God raises them up out of the dunghill and God says, I have royalty for you. And you say, I'll just take a two-story house and a jet ski. It's prosperity with a purpose. So people get frustrated at the prosperity message because they don't actually have a purpose. They don't actually have a vision. But when you understand that God says you will have a surplus of prosperity in the land that I've sent you to so that you can establish my covenant in the earth, then you say, God, I don't just want to pay my bills. I want to fund the kingdom of God on the earth. What is your woe is me? Can you say amen? amen? Then it goes from not just I want to be healed because I'm in pain to I want to be healed because I got work to do. There's people I'm going to be leading to Jesus. There's assignments in prayer I have to accomplish. My pastor's heading somewhere and I'm going with him. I'm going to be right beside him. He's talking about multitudes standing in fields, standing in auditoriums, standing in stadiums, hearing the preaching of the gospel. I'm going to be right there with him. I'm not leaving before that's accomplished. I have a necessity and my necessity is to see the Inland Empire shaken by the hand of God. Can you say amen? Achieving God's best for your life. Because you can be as prosperous as Elon Musk and as healthy as Dr. Oz. But if you have no vision, it's vain. Can you say amen? If you have no vision, it's vain. And your vision is always tied into the larger vision of the house you're connected to. 
and the house you're connected to should be tied into the larger vision of the Great Commission. Amen, amen. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. 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 Now I want you to think about this. If you're to move your finger, it's because your finger is receiving electric, electrical signals from where? From the head. But in order to get that signal to the finger, that signal has to travel down the head, down the arm, down the forearm, into the hand, and down into the finger. If the finger is connected, disconnected, the head can send all the signals it wants to. The finger is not receiving anything. Now, is the finger connected to the head right here? So people say, well, I don't need a pastor. I have Jesus. Uh-oh. Is my finger sticking out of my head? Amen. The finger's connected to the hand. The hand's connected to the forearm. Knee bone's connected to the... Amen. Amen. And so wherever you are in the body of Christ, whatever your role is, whatever your function is, it's connected to something else. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. The husband is supposed to be the head of his home. So husbands, if your home doesn't have a vision, you're responsible for pitching that vision. Well, pastor, it's a little late now. All my children have moved out. And, and no, it's not too late. Pitch a vision now. This is the direction we're going as a family. This is what we're going to be doing. Can you say amen? Because what happens, what if the whole body is still connected, but the brain isn't sending any signals? What does that mean? Do. Amen. Activity is proof of life. So you not only have a vision for your life, you have a vision for your family, you tie into the vision for your church, you connect to the greater vision of the body of Christ that we call the Great Commission. And when you do that, when you are really, I'm not talking about, like I said, you're attending church. I'm talking about you're really tied in. When you are tied in to what God is doing on the earth and how God wants it done, then heaven's gates, God's absolute best will be poured out on your life. Think about this. Five years before he died, Billy Graham in an interview said, I want to die. Five years before he died, Billy Graham said, I want to die. Why didn't God just let him die? Because three times a year, they'd put him on television and he'd preach the gospel. And because it was Billy Graham, thousands would listen. And even from the porch of his North Carolina home, he was still leading thousands of people to the Lord. So the Lord said, I'm not letting you go anywhere. You're still too useful to me. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you get tied into a vision, that vision engenders long life. Because you're useful. Because you're useful. Because you're fruitful. Because you're producing something. Because you're bringing life into the whole of the body. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Oral Roberts, same thing. He wanted to die long before he died. Kenneth Hagin wanted to die in 1992 when he turned 73. And he lived another 10 years. Thanks a lot, Lord. But God was still using him. God had one more assignment for Brother Hagin. He tells about it in the 90s. You can listen to his messages. He says, God spoke to me and said, there's a move of God that you must teach this generation about or it will be lost to them. And there will be a whole generation that does not know the move of the Spirit. 
And so in the 90s, he focused on the move of the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And the joy, just like in our services, the joy of the Lord would hit the place. People laughing uncontrollably, people shouting, people running all over the place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Healings and miracles. Amen. Amen. When you're tied to the vision, it's hard to die. But when you're not tied to the vision, it's hard to live. Tie into the greater vision. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you get something out of that this morning? Did the Lord touch you this morning? Are you happy? Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord praise in this place this morning. Give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Now, I didn't preach an offering message this morning, but we're going to give you an opportunity to give. Ask the Lord what he'd have you give today. You thought I forgot, but I didn't. Ask the Lord what he'd have you give today. Be obedient. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Ushers are coming down the way. I want to announce this. All of the monies and more than enough came in for the equipment that we were needing. Glory to God. Come on, glory to God. So we're going to the next level. Amen. We've already purchased some of the equipment. We're going to be purchasing more this week. Hallelujah. Just need a little bit of input from a few people who know more than me. And uh, we're going to be purchasing that equipment. I'm very excited. We'll even be able to purchase some equipment that I wasn't planning on. Praise the Lord. And then, I can't announce what it is yet. So don't ask. But something big. Something very, very big. Three of you are excited. That's phenomenal. Something big. Amen. God is up to something. It's going to be a great summer. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. While you're filling out your offering envelopes, can I get the slide for um, Marianne Lawrence, please? This next Sunday, I will be in Tampa, Florida, getting filled up so I can come back and pour out. Amen. Amen. But next Sunday, Marianne Lawrence will be preaching our Sunday morning service. Hallelujah. Amen. The mighty woman of God. We're so excited. It's going to be a great time in the presence of God. Listen, don't miss church just because I'm not here. Amen. Amen. God has something for you. Hallelujah. We want you here. It's going to be a great time. Every time she's ministered, God's done something awesome. And I know this Sunday will be no different. Amen. Y'all okay with me going to get filled up in Florida? Amen. Hallelujah. And then next Sunday night, I'll be watching Ruby and Crystal graduate their first year of Bible school. Ruby will text me and say, it was hard, Pastor, but I did it. Amen. And I said, well, I never told you it was easy, so get over it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. For the sake of those who might not know, you can give online this morning at paypal.me slash truth, the letter N triumph, truth and triumph. You can give by text at 628-444-4136. Text the word give and the number of the amount you'd like to give, like give one million. Hallelujah. You'll receive a text back with a link. Tap that link, enter your card information. Once you've done it once, you can hit remember me so you don't have to do it again. You can give by Cash app at dollar sign truth, the letter N, triumph, all one word, dollar sign truth and triumph. Or you can give by Venmo, at symbol truth, the letter N, triumph, all one word, at truth and triumph. Hallelujah. You can also give by Zelle. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm telling you, you people are crazy. Sit here for three hours and let me yell at you and then get excited about it. You all are awesome. I love you so much. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say this with me this morning. Say, my best days days are ahead of me. me. Say, my family's best days days are ahead of me. me. Say, my church's best days days are ahead of us. 
Say the kingdom of God's best days days. are ahead of us. us. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And here's what I want you to see in your mind. Every time we gather together, every Sunday, every Wednesday, revival services, fellowships, helps training, outreaches, whatever we do, every time we gather together, we are taking another step toward fulfilling the vision of this church. So today, we are one step closer to seeing the Inland Empire shaken by the mighty hand of God. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say this with me. The Lord is good. good. And his mercy endures forever. forever. Now I want you to do me a quick favor. I'm going to pray. We'll dismiss. But I want everyone to look back at the red clock back there. And give the Lord praise. (laughs) He's a God of miracles. There's nothing too hard for him. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Y'all ready to give? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for both the gift and the giver this morning. I thank you, Father, that what is given shall be returned back to them, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You'll cause men to give into their pockets, you said. Father, you said you give seed to the sower and bread for eating. You multiply the seed sown and you increase the fruits of our righteousness. And you cause us to be enriched in everything unto all generosity. And the increase of our generosity results in greater thanksgiving, greater honor, greater glory being brought to you. And that's the desire of our heart, Father, that our life would bring you the greatest, the maximum level of glory and honor and gratitude in Jesus' name. We give with expectation this morning for multiplication. And we praise you in advance for it today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give. Once you give, you can jump up on your feet. Hallelujah. And I'll bless you before you go. Yes. Uh, There is, of course, Wednesday service at 7 p.m. Don't miss it. Amen. If you can make it to Wednesdays, I encourage you to come. They've been an awesome time. Amen. Amen. The Holy Ghost moving and touching people. It's been great. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Once you've given, jump up on your feet with me. Let me bless you before you go. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless these precious people. I command them, be fruitful, multiply, take dominion in Jesus' name in every area of your life. Let this week, Father, be a week of miracles in their family. Let this week, Father, be a week of miracles in their finances. Let every person return to your house next Sunday with a great testimony of your faithfulness, your generosity, your miracle working power in Jesus' name. Let the anointing that was ministered in this place today rest on them heavily that it might touch those around them in the coming days of this week in Jesus' name. Give them opportunities, Father, to expand the kingdom of God through soul winning, through generosity, through laying hands on the sick this week in the name of Jesus. Let every person produce fruit for you this week in Jesus' name. And you're with me, say? Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you.